You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for March 31st, 2023. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we really do love hearing from you, most of you anyway. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Nearly all of you. Nearly all of you. We love hearing from nearly all of you. And. I have to um, scrape out uh, uh, the occasional anonymous comment on my blog who's complaining that I don't take on the Democrats hard enough. And don't I realize the Democrats are the root of all evil and why am I so oh. – And I, I – and the, the person who writes this writes like five paragraphs. I delete them every time. So I admire their persistence. But they're never, ever going to get posted. So you but, should know. You know, that. as Hal Sparks says, it's still engagement and it counts. Exactly. And it, it, it – towards our massive Google ads – uh, revenue, so it counts. <laughs> that we have so none. Counts. We have none. none. That's gone now. Um, yeah, Blue Gal, how you doing? Doing all right. It's been a tough week. Yeah. Anytime an elementary school gets shot up, that's a tough week, and and the <sighs> hopelessness that comes with that is tough. Um, but I'm seeing uh increases in statements from people that I would not expect to make those statements, saying enough is enough, something has to change. Yeah. And people. You know, who are in parts of the country where this isn't supposed to happen because we're white hunters and we we respect firearms in our state and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, And all of a sudden it hits four year olds in their state. And uh, it's going I mean, someone mentioned that on in an article. I don't know whether it was Vox or Slate or whatever, but that if we just keep going at this pace, everyone will have someone in their family who was shot to death at a school. Yes, this that's, and that's so the thing. And so at some point, it's going to affect everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can either do something about it before that happens to you and your family, or uh-huh. just, just wait. Yeah. And I hate to be that cynical, uh, but that's where we're at. It, and, uh, this might or might not be apropos, but um, homicide, life on the streets. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an episode with Robin Williams. Um, he and his family were in Baltimore, and their their uh, I believe wife was shot. And he has to interact with the homicide unit, and he catches them at uh, sort of talking casually among themselves, and just is, is furious, mm-hmm. furious at them not taking his wife's murder seriously because he's sitting in the in in a city with his kids, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go. What do you do with the body? I mean, how, just completely unable to cope. Mm-hmm. Um, and he stumbles upon these homicide detectives just talking very callously and, and the about uh, ballistics and guns about, and, about bodies, yeah. and murder, right. and, you know, right. this, this one and that one. And as I recall, it was Yafet Kodo is the uh, Lieutenant commander and sort of takes him aside and says, look, you know, I'm not quoting directly, but um, when you work in homicide, we're really sorry. It, it, we do take this seriously, but when you've been in homicide for a long time, um, you got to develop a sense of humor. I remember the first, second homicide I worked on. I don't remember the 10th. I don't remember the hundredth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but Robin Williams has this incredibly mesmerizing speech on the roof where there's a swing set. As I recall, he wants to handle a gun. He wants to show him a gun and, and no, he's down on the stairs by the courthouse. Cause he's got to stay there for the trial and everything. And he's talking to, I think Kyle Secor, I think the detective, and he's talking very quietly. And you can, this is where you knew Robin Williams could really act. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, there's a club. We're all in a club. We murder victims. We're all in a club. That woman over there, she's in the club. Her over there. And he, he, said, he said, you can spot them. You can tell. People who've been traumatized, people who've had people shot in their lives who died, you can tell who they are. We don't talk. We don't have meetings. But there's a club. And now I'm in it. And I'm in mm-hmm. it for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And there's a real sense that at some point, there'll be enough people who, whose lives have been ruined by guns. Right. That they'll simply not permit the yeah, but Second Amendment, yeah, but good guys. They will guns. not Bullshit. permit Republicans to sit in a legislature and do nothing. They will remove them by voting, right? And and things will change. Yeah. And this is Republican. This is Republican. This is Republican. Republicans, and and that hopefully that vice, one half of the jaws of that vice is abortion, and the other half is guns. 
and they will crush yep. the Republican Party yep. until it's until it is and no healthcare. longer. Don't forget yeah. health care. Yeah. But you know what? We're going to do a letter show. Well, we're going to do some of your letters. Uh, Drift Glass put some comments from his blog and other places in here. Uh, and some of them were just, you guys are so great. And I want to talk for a paragraph about how great you are. And I told Drift Glass that we weren't going to read those this week. Look, <laughs> I, I worked very hard barbering those comments and inventing them in whole cloth. And, and I and deleted stuff. all of them. Yeah, I know. I we love you. Them. We love you back. We do. We do. Uh, but we're not going to, we're not in the business of self-aggrandizement entirely. <laughs> entirely. <laughs> Someone has to aggrandize this blue gal. I guess that's <laughs> no one me. else is going to do it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So this letter is from John. Dear G, dear DGBG, I'm categorically unwilling to give up on the prospect of a liberalized media enterprise. In fact, I believe that such an entity represents a necessary step in beginning to repair the damage done by American conservatism in the last few decades. I'm also categorically unwilling to accept former GOP operatives, a.k.a. mercenary liars, as any part of that enterprise, spoken after our own hearts. Unfortunately, given their influence, however undeserved, it's highly likely that they'll weasel their way in. Oh, yeah. Assuming an intentional liberal outlet ever actually materializes. I cannot imagine how sick you both are of beating this drum. I'm much less politically aware and historically educated than you. Well, don't make that mistake, John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, you've ta both taught me much, and I thank you for that. And I feel like I've been digitally screaming about this stuff enough to burn throat and fingers raw, and you've been doing it for a decade longer. Yeah. I hold out hope that blogs like yours and Digby, Empty Wheel, No More Mr. Nice Blog and others, and Daily Coast and the Guardian, can eventually form a media Voltron of some sort. <laughs> well, hope springs eternal. I um, And and what what goes unspoken or undocumented, because it can't be documented because time only moves in one direction, is the fact that most of us were talking about this stuff among ourselves personally before the dawn of blogging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, we were heartily sick of hearing David Brooks's bullshit in the New York Times Long before you could hit publish on Blogger and let the world know that you were sick of David Brooks' bullshit. Right. Right. And both so, sides do it and all and all the rest of it. So there's a whole sort of uncaptured decade or more of liberal thinking and commentary that exists in some magazines and, and some, uh, you know, Utney Reader or whatnot, but not out where you can dig into your archives and find them. But I tell you, it's been a long, hard fight. And I really wish there were a media Voltron that would join us all together and we could all become a mighty thing. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that and go on to a letter from Paul. DG and BG, I thought the second podcast about remembering the past that focused on Brooks was very well done and achieved your aim of providing context for where the mainstream media are today. It's a rare day when you hear such depth about an issue from any quarter. It's very important and just about totally lacking today. I'm a longtime lefty, and although I know the media is biased and so both siderist, I have to be reminded of how this virus crept into our political discourse. Looking forward to the coming episodes. It does round out your message. He adds, Brooks is a slimy creep, isn't he? Yes, he is. He really, really is. Uh, you documented that fact very well. I think I heard you guys say you follow Jay Rosen on Twitter. We do, and we, we like his work very much. I suppose you've seen the thought-provoking article that Rosen referred to by James Fallows, linked below, which addresses many of the same issues you guys harp on. And I want to remind everybody that we actually did an episode with Jay Rosen on this very show. It was episode 524, December 13th, 2019. You can look it up. And yeah, we're big fans of Jay. Yep. And we pay extra to have all of our archives still sitting there at Buzzsprout so that people can go back and listen to them. Yes, we uh, do. Don't listen to the first year of episodes. That no. that would be wrong. It's like it's like the first year of Babylon Five. You know, it right. has you just moments, skip that season. <laughs> it has moments that are good, and you understand where it's going, and it's setting it up, and there's a lot of throat clearing, and this is where we're going. But you don't really need to. Get no, it. no, our our professional and professional left came much later. Yes. Uh, okay, this is a letter from Caitlin. I moved over from PayPal to become a twenty five dollar a month patron. Five dollars for me, and the rest to cover listeners who can't afford to support. Wow. Thank you, Caitlin. We appreciate that. Yeah, we very much People do. that can afford to uh, co-sponsor, people who can't afford mm. to support our show. Yeah. You guys are great. 
Yeah. Well, we do hear it from a lot of people who we know are strapped. Oh, who yeah. Are, who, who are just barely getting by and they appreciate what we do. And this is our gift to them. It is Absolutely. something that requires a certain level of maintenance on our parts. We can't do it for free forever. But well, we and we've just the- gotten hit with a, we're going to have to turn our lives, digital lives upside down. I yeah. might as well insert that here. Yeah. Our, yeah. our internet cable phone bill went up by $50 a month this month. Yeah. Yeah. And so and we're going to have to switch carriers and switch phone internet contract. service provider and so forth because yeah. we can't afford that. And, uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to buy our cell phones that we're paying off. You know, I mean, it's just, it's going to be a very complicated month for us <laughs> getting well, things, like, getting uh-huh. things managed. But, uh, you know, that's where, that's where we're at. Um, a bill that hits us, I, you and I talked about this, that, mm-hmm. you know, I have this fantasy of someday taking a round trip cruise across the Atlantic and doing nothing for right. 14 days and coming right. back the same way. And it's like, that's our health insurance deductible. Right. That's what we spend it on is healthcare. Mm-hmm. And so that's never going to happen for us. And plus you're too tall for a cruise, but I know. Um, well, we way can, too tall okay. for a cruise. To be fair, we can afford one way, but we can't afford a round trip <laughs> cruise. I want you back. So we're he not wants doing me that. back. I do. Anyway, the point is we have expenses. We have financial difficulties from time to time. And when we are living month to month, like a lot of you, like a lot of you. Yeah. So, so uh, we understand that. But if you're able to take an actual vacation where you go on a trip, not to see family, but just for fun. Yeah. Then we ask you to chip in five bucks yeah. and let us breathe a little easier that way. And we yeah. really appreciate when you do that. Yes, we do. And and this is, you know, there are a few of them out there, but we do pride ourselves on the fact that we actually are working class Midwestern American yep. liberals. And there's just not a lot of us out there. I was joking with um, one of our friends uh, on the Twitter uh, from New York, who we know in real life. We've met him a few times. And, and mm-hmm. uh, I was actually a speaker at one of their events. And I really do appreciate that. A paid speaker at one of their events. Ha ha, David Brooks. I got the one you didn't get. <clears throat> um, but uh, he said something that I had uh, coined years ago. And um, we went back and forth about it. And the person who replied to him said, yeah, but I, yours resonates so much more. And, he and quoted I, you verbatim on verbatim. Twitter, and then yeah, but, and then someone yours, said yours resonates, yeah. which is which is funny. And I yeah. said, oh, it must be my Midwest accent, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I don't yeah. really have. I think I have a Colorado accent, but I don't have a Midwest accent. But it it really is, uh, but it's a source of pride for us. We are literally one of the very very few liberal, democratic, long term institutional podcasts and bloggers who actually live in the middle of Middle America. And are a member of the working class. And with yep. all of the problems and challenges and joys that entails. We're also church going. So, yeah. you know, it yeah. is a little like we are a unicorn. And we kind of like being a unicorn because we wouldn't have it yeah. any other way. But we don't um, get, you don't get a six-figure salary with that. No. So no, you, <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> no. If you sell unicorn horn to people as a uh, as an aphrodisiac <laughs> on Alex Jones' show, then you get yeah, the six figure Yeah, then you get the six-figure salary, yeah. but we don't uh, get that. No. This no. this next letter is from Ken, who said, I, I'd actually laughed out loud when Drift Glass uttered, these fucking people. Yeah, I do that sometimes. In response to the Utah legislature overriding the governor's veto of an anti-trans bill, as it's a favorite refrain of mine going back 30 years. Well, mine too, Ken. Mine yeah, too. the way he said it, though, the way you said it, Drift Glass, he's, was he's just, fucking. these fucking people. Uh. Here is a letter from Lawrence, dear Drift and Fran. I have been thinking about this for a while, and you kind of scooped me on last week's podcast concerning abortion law and the argument about exceptions for rape and incest. Shouldn't we be talking more about why there is so much rape and incest? Yes, we should. We should. The media narrative about these things as it relates to abortion policy erases the horror of the bare narrative, excuse me, erases the horror of the bare existence of these things at all, obscuring the needed conversation about why these circumstances are a consideration for public policy. I can imagine a Star Trek episode where they visit planet pro-life, but you learn that abortions are permitted in a sub rosa realm of policy that protects the official reality by dealing with the truly deviant cases out of sight with the men responsible getting punished according to their crimes. Mm -hmm. That is not the deal Republicans want. 
What is more amusing than getting Republicans to stomp on their own dicks by commenting on rape? Not much. If one has the macabre sense of humor that seems to be necessary to endure these times. The last states to outlaw spousal rape did so in 1993. Yeah. This would not be possible today. I think he's right. I think I he's right. I think there are states that would get into a twist and not act on spousal rape today. I think they'd Absolutely. uphold it. The, I think the state courts would uphold it in at least 12 states I can think of. Yep. Yep. So why not get some comments on the record? We know you oppose Oberfell and Griswold. What about rapity rape rape? Are married white women listening? Yeah. Those are really good questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you asked them of us. And we will pass them along to everyone we know. Uh, Adam B. sent us a message via Patreon. I was shown a link to your podcast once and randomly a year ago on TuneIn and was so impressed right from the start. I've been meaning to support you ever since, and now I can. Yay! Like most normals, it's been hard to effectively argue against the bullshit talking points I get from even my closest friends. It's hard to make a point when the opposition doesn't need to bother with truth or a common set of good faith facts. This is my own aside, by the way. This is why I don't want to hear any more from anybody talking about, you got to listen to what they're saying, feel their pain. You got to understand, liberals, they, there's some valid feelings behind all the racist, insane bullshit. You know what? I don't care. We're surrounded by these people. You don't need to lecture us about what they think and feel. It's coming out of every radio in this town every day. Mm -hmm. That's the end of my side. Back to Adam. Thanks so much for what you both do. I can't tell you how mentally validating it is to hear all all the fucked up things I remember about the W administration, the Scarboroughs, the goddamn Peggy Noonans, the Bill Crystals, ugh, they sound so reasonable on the Joe show until you remember all the times they had the opposite opinions or blamed libs for something I'm pretty sure the cons did or ignored. Double ugh. There you go. That's why remembering stuff is so naughty. I appreciate <laughs> you both more than you know. The No Fair Remembering Stuff series pushed me over the edge to make sure and donate. I look forward to all your content every week. Short of all that Soros money you get, I oh, hope. Oh, yeah, hope. right. You know, it, it's, hey, look, it's tip money, okay? Basically, it's tip, tip money. Uh, rambling message over. Lastly, Don Jr.'s on Coke. What can I say? I've heard it, rumors that Don Jr.'s rumors. on Coke. Uh, you yes, hear these I've rumors, heard that. And, and I remember back during the Clinton years, I believe it was, when uh, even the appearance of an impropriety needed to be rigorously investigated. So even the appearance of being coked out of your mind on TikTok, I think, needs to be rigorously investigated. But that's just me. What do I know? <laughs> All right. Peggy writes to us. I love the part of the show where you said that your daughter decided to go to Missouri and help make it better. I live in Kansas. And I hear so many people say, why don't you just move to a more sensible place? Mm -hmm. I don't think we should abandon half the country to the people who want to drag us backwards. But so many young people are taking off for the coasts, including two of my girls. Yeah. I wonder if your daughter knows about Blue Missouri. Yes, she does. They're trying to change things at the state level. Jess Piper at Piper for Missouri ran for state legislature as a dirt road Democrat. She lost badly, but says many of the seats were uncontested. And yes, we know about that from our own ballots. Mm -hmm. And you can't win what you don't try for. I also wondered what drunken Irish policeman mysteries your dad likes. Uh, he likes the, the ones that he was reading at the time you wrote this letter, Peggy, were Adrian McKinty, the Sean Duffy novels. So if you want to go check those out, uh, that's those were the ones he was reading at that time. He likes drunken Irish, sad, widowed, the girl got away, I'm all alone, and then there's this murder to investigate. <laughs> that's, that's his book. Preferably just after World War One and during the right. Troubles. So, right, during the you know, Troubles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of fertile fertile stuff there. Fertile stuff um, there, absolutely. And I'm going to read a letter from Paul now. Paul writes, hi, guys. I'm a longtime listener and contributor, and I have to say I love listening to your show. Well, thank you, Paul. It lets me listen in on your lives and gives me an idea how other communities are shaped by local and national politics. Mission accomplished. Good for us. So I thought I would share a little bit of our lives here in Louisville, Colorado. I'm actually writing this while the president is touring a few blocks away in the fire-ravaged neighborhoods just to our west. Of course, I had no cho uh, no chance, pardon me, of seeing him, but recently he's really stepping it up. 
telling the world what really happened on January 6th and laying the blame squarely where it belongs on our horrible previous president. Biden has been giving us some long needed straight talk and I look forward to more. So do we. But I digress. Let me tell you about Louisville. First off, it's pronounced Louis rhyming with sue us, not Louis like a long dead French king. It was named by a local settler, Louis Nawatani, who named it for himself. Good for him. Louisville started as a coal mining community and is now home to roughly 20,000 residents. Its temperate climate, many parks, and wonderful downtown are some of its reasons why Louisville has been named one of the best places to live in the United States. In some ways, it has become too prosperous. As Californians sold their homes and moved to Boulder, neighboring Louisville saw home values rise. I wouldn't be able to move here if I hadn't arrived decades ago. Homes have gotten too expensive. Another brief aside, my grandmother and grandfather and aunt lived in a house my uncle bought them in Boulder sometime in the late 60s, early 70s. I could not afford to buy the garage attached to that house anymore. Mm-hmm. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a gorgeous town, a beautiful place, and uh, well worth the scenery. But yeah. out of reach to most people these oh, days. Oh, wildly out of reach. Yeah. All of the homes. My relatives lived in in the 60s and 70s in Colorado. They're seven-figure houses now. Are now seven-figure houses. And they haven't changed at all. They're just... No. They're, they're split-level the, aluminum siding houses yeah. <laughs> that are a million dollars. Yeah. Demand. I, I, I think I mentioned this before. My uncle had a ranch just outside of uh, Denver. It had many acres around it. He had horses out there. Uh, he built his own home. He, does, he did that every time he was alive. Um, the acreage is all gone now. It's been gobbled up by condos. But his original house is still there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Where I played as a kid, we watched TV, had barbecues outside, hunted for night crawlers. Um, However, it's now in the high mid seven figures to buy the same house. So it's, you know, that's that's the way of the world, I suppose. Anyway, um, we have, however, had some interesting weather recently. Things have been drying up in a big way. In the last six months, we received 1.1 inches of rain, our driest six months ever recorded. That is drier than Death Valley, 1.9 inches, 1.9 inches, and the desert around Phoenix, 5.6 inches. If you watch the news, you know what happened. Something started a fire six miles to the west, and there was nothing stopping the blaze. It didn't take long before the fire reached homes and everyone in town was asked to evacuate. I have never been in a position of leaving my home, not knowing if it would be there when I returned. The fire destroyed hundreds of homes near me, But as I discovered several days later, when I was able to return, the fire had stopped just a few short blocks from my house. My house itself was fine, despite being on the edge of one of the prairie open spaces. I have seen some of the damage. It is heartbreaking and devastating. So many people lost their beautiful homes, and there is one known death. There aren't any unoccupied residences in the area, not even available apartments for the displaced to live and rebuild. I feel so sorry for them. And at the same time, so lucky. That's pretty much it. You've shared your lives with me for well over 600 weeks now. And now I had something to write you back about. I suppose if there's a moral to all of this, it's not to get too attached to things. You don't own them, really. And they can be gone in an instant. And why the heck is Louis DeJoy still running the goddamn post office? I added the goddamn, asking for a friend. Thanks for all you do. You've kept me hopeful through some very dark political times. I keep hoping things get back to normal, but then I realize I never really cared for normal all that much. Let's shoot for better. Much love, Paul. Hey, man, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And our last letter is from Andy in England, who has been with us, body and soul, (laughs) almost from the beginning, really. Yeah, really. Uh, Yeah, I consider him a good friend, as I do many of you. And he writes us, You asked for people to tell their story rather than simply recounting incidents that they remembered on the first show of the ProLeft podcast they listened to. (laughs) To be honest, I can't recall the first one I came across, as at the time, summer 2011, I was in the first few months of dealing with the appalling pain of as then undiagnosed back problem. I couldn't walk without the aid of a stick and the prospect of going more than 50 yards down the road posed enormous problems regarding planning of where to rest and how long I could go before the pain stopped me moving anymore. Mm -hmm. When you can't move around too much, your world is restricted. I had gone from running a half marathon in late March 2011 to being virtually housebound by the following week. Searching around, I could invent an interesting anecdote here, but that would be a lie, I came across 
half an hour or so of two people ranting about subjects I vaguely knew about concerning U.S. politics. Apologies for the ranting jibe, but I soon realized these two people were highly intelligent, well-informed, and to top it all off, in love. Who were they, Andy? Tell us. Who were they? Yeah, it's us. An operation in 2012 allowed me to start walking, working, and eventually running again after 19 months away from life. However, despite getting back into the saddle, I found I couldn't do without my regular dose of Americana from the Midwest, and so I'm still here. Well, since I know there will be multiple letters on this edition of the podcast and the vast majority of the listeners won't want to hear about the horrors of Brexit, the multiple Tory prime ministers, one of which was famously outlasted by a lettuce, yes, and the Byzantine machinations of UK politics, I'll cut that short and leave it at that. If you follow Andy on Twitter, you would see all of this. He's he's very good about going after the BBC, etc. Fran asked about my hopes and dreams. I'm now retired after 44 years as a lab technician and volunteering at the hospital that restored my ability to walk way back in 2012. So my hope is to offer a bit of comfort to patients who are going through a lot worse than I had to cope with. I'm a neuro buddy and go around the wards each Monday with my good friend Donna, who had a stroke some 30 years ago and had to overcome far worse than I. My dreams are probably in line with most listeners to see Mr. Trump in a prison cell and for Fox News to go broke. One can hope. Anyway, I'm still running a lot more slowly than a few years ago, and the half marathons are no more. However, 10K is still okay for this 65-year-old, and so I'll be running under the mercy, M-E-R-S-E-Y, yes, mercy, on the 16th of April, 25 years since I first did that race in 1998. Good for you, Andy. Yeah. Your show has been both an inspiration and an education for me, and I learn something new every week. Oh, okay, most weeks. And long may it continue with love and affection, Andy from England. Thank you, Andy. Boy, do I remember your struggles back when we first met. You were were in bad shape, and I'm so glad they were able to, what can I say, the National Health Service. Yeah. We wish we had that here, Andy. And, and we, we know your nieces from when they were itty bitty. Oh my gosh. His niece, you know, Flo was her, her kitten jammies were the first internet kitty. That's right. That's ever. right. The first internet kitty was, were her and now jammies. she's, you know, all that. She's running for prime for, minister. <laughs> she's running for prime minister, <laughs> not as a Tory. No, no. no Andy is our, is our sort of Alistair Cook. He's our, yeah. the British guy who explains Americans to Americans and does a very good job of it. Yes. And for the Brits as well. Um, Thank you, shout- everybody who wrote to us. Yes, we really do appreciate. It. We read, and we got lots and lots and lots of letters, and we um, cut them down a little bit, and we edited them a little bit for for time. Uh, we do read them all, swear to God, and we do take your suggestions very seriously. We got a lot of feedback for Science Fiction University, and a lot yeah. of really good suggestions. I'm well. I gotta the- say that that's rabbit syndrome. <clears throat> yeah. You know, uh, I I talk about that uh, with yeah. Drift Glass. Rabbit syndrome is we will write post after post or do podcast after podcast about politics and our audience, many in our audience just feel like they can't teach us anything about politics. So they're not going to write. That would be scary to write to drift glass and blue gal about politics. Mm -hmm. But if we mention something about gardening or science fiction or a movie or uh, cooking, then the letters flow in because everybody can have a safe opinion about that. Right. And uh, I, I remember that from back in the day when I wrote about rabbits in my garden. And all of a sudden I had 36 comments at one post, <laughs> which was like, where have you people been? <laughs> well, well they were reading me, but they didn't have anything to add. But everybody has opinion about how to keep rabbits out of your garden. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Science Fiction University, you know, we get yeah. a lot of and people enjoy a lot it. Of we letters. Have yeah. fun doing it, you know, but they're very, very often like. I don't know if you realize this, but Gene Roddenberry did a thing called the Quester Tapes in 1974. Like, yeah, <laughs> cool. We can talk about that, and nobody gets angry. Yeah, um, there's yeah. not controversial. It's just a, it's just a total nerd out on some stuff that we love. Other people may not. That's their business. Uh, this is what we like doing, and we read a lot of science fiction. So, um, uh, and watch reflects, a lot of science fiction. We do, we do, yeah. and we watch it. We watch it for the podcast. We don't enjoy it at all. <laughs> It's a drag. <laughs> That's not true. No, it's not true at all. No, it's, it's, and I have, we just gave away, I don't know what, 
six, seven, eight boxes of books. Yeah, from the, six, I think. A ton of books. Six boxes Lots of, of books, books and one box of DVDs. And it didn't make a dent in our in our nope. actual stuff. But nope. we do have bored feet of science fiction of all kinds, short story collections, yeah. collections by author, some autographed, which are kind of fun. But it, we really do enjoy it. it. It's extremely interesting as literature, and we hope we bring a little bit of that passion and knowledge to you. And But we do read all the comments. And let's do a news roundup, shall we? Yes, let's do a news roundup. Kevin McCarthy suggested that lawmakers need to see, quote, all the facts, unquote, before they consider any gun legislation following the shooting in Nashville where seven people were killed. I've got a fact for you, Kevin. You're a yeah. Yeah. The done. Nashville shooting was the 130th mass shooting incident in the United States this year so far. Democrats plan to introduce a measure to boost federal research into the cause of gun violence, but it has had little chance of passing the Republican-controlled House. Republican Congressman Tim Burchett, meanwhile, said Congress is not going to fix the problem of school shootings and that he doesn't see a role for Congress in preventing future shootings other than mess things up. He sees a role for Congress in collecting money from the NRA. That's what yeah. he sees a role for Congress in doing. Yep. Uh, and, and you know, we have all kinds of things we'd like to say to Tim Burchett, but uh, they are not fit for publication on this podcast. No, or if we see him, we can shout at him in public, which is the only way to deal with these people from now on. Yeah. First, first, shout at the media for not asking these questions. What the what right. the hell's wrong with you, you cowards? Then go right after them in public and scream at them about it's your why are you allowing people to die? Why do you why are you okay with kids dying? And don't take anything for an answer other mm -mm. than capitulation, because I'm real tired. I'm sure you all are real tired of listening to these people bullshit about their Second Amendment rights and the sanctity of their home and got to have guns, good guy with a gun. I don't want to hear another word from any of these people. I really don't. And we've already said all this, so let's move on to North Carolina, where residents no longer need a permit to buy a handgun. The state's Republican-led legislature eliminated the longstanding permit system that required local sheriffs to perform character evaluations and criminal history checks of pistol applicants. Although Democratic Governor Roy Cooper vetoed the measure, the legislature overrode the veto. The permit repeal takes effect immediately. Meanwhile, let's count our blessings that North Carolina decided to expand Medicaid this week. From Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, personal hero of mine, the Administrative Office of the Courts sent me a letter confirming the Judicial Conference of the U.S. has adopted new, stricter rules requiring way more disclosure of free trips, meals, and other hospitality accepted by federal judges and Supreme Court justices. Uh-huh. Coming for you, Ginny Thomas. We're coming for you. Uh, Idaho is about to become the first state to restrict interstate travel for abortion. Isn't that just fucking special? The bill would create a whole new crime dubbed abortion trafficking, which aims to limit minors' ability to travel for abortion care without parental consent. Unconstitutional and unenforceable. But yeah. It's Idaho. Yeah. Uh, a Florida bill would instantly ban books based on a single objection from one resident. Mm -hmm. So uh, Drift Glass is going to move to Florida for a day right. and object to all of Ron DeSantis's books. All of Ron DeSantis, uh, the collection of Ayn Rand, Reagan, every biography of Reagan and the Bible. Um, oh, that's good. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, re the Republican-controlled Missouri House has voted to strip all state funding from public libraries. Yeah, the, the, there were uh, there was a real danger of people in, in Missouri, young people in Missouri, not being raised as illiterate morons. Mm -hmm. So we got to stop that from happening, uh, if, if at all possible. Um, a federal judge ordered Mike Pence to testify to a grand jury investigating Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. Sorry, Mike, you're going to have to talk on the stand with your hand on the Bible. Uh, that jerk, Kevin McCarthy, again, he demanded a meeting with Biden to discuss raising the debt limit. The White House, however, responded to McCarthy's demands by calling for House Republicans to produce a budget proposal first. Kevin McCarthy told Fox News that the debt ceiling has nothing to do with the budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a dummy. Yeah. I, I, I picture in my mind fighting Joe Biden, clapping his hand over his crotch, going, I got your debt limit right here, Kevin, right here. <laughs> Fuck you, you little puppet, you little... Anyway, before I anyway, get in trouble hmm. with the FCC, let's move on to Fo from Vox. This is from Vox. The House GOP's investigations are flopping. Oh, no. 
Oh, house Repu- no. It's very sad. The House Republicans are still looking for their next Benghazi, but their investigations are very unpopular. Oh, no. No more Benghazi for you. So sad. From the New Republic, no labels pitched to donors pretends Joe Biden doesn't exist. Yes, it does. <sighs> Would you read this next part, Dirk Glass? I'd be happy to, because I have a few things to say about no labels. Yeah. Uh, a video obtained by the New Republic tries to suggest that both parties are being captured by extremes, but somehow forgets to acknowledge the sitting president or the previous Democratic president named Barack Obama or the Democratic president before that named Bill Clinton or the Democratic president before that named James Earl Carter. Uh, it really is the same grift over and over and over again. And there's just a shit ton of money in lying to people. In, I wrote a post two days after No Labels uh, was founded in 2010. Two days. I wouldn't change a word of it. It is mm-hmm. a grift by by cynical Washington, D.C. Beltway insiders. The original board included Mark McKinnon, Joe Scarborough, and David fucking Brooks. And it was, you know, the, the two parties. They're just exactly the same. They're both corrupt. And it's always the same grift. And it's always the same lie. And I wrote the goddamn thing 13 years ago. So I, for one, am grateful that people are slowly catching up to where we were 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Um, and you know Speaking what? Speaking of catching up to where, where we were 13 years ago, yeah. this week, Matt Taibbi literally tweeted, I'm an independent. Because that's where the Greenwald grift is. And I am so appreciative of all the people who let me know yeah. that when they read Matt Taibbi's tweet, quote, I'm an independent. They heard it in my voice. Absolutely. I did too. I got to say, it, Taibbi is a writer. Glenn Greenwald is a writer, but they don't have a thesaurus. They can't come up with any <laughs> word other than independent. And, and this is what I, this is my question for all of you independents out there. Uh, the forward party uh, scammers, the the uh, the no label scammers, the country over party scammers, Matthew Dad, all of you guys. This week, Bernie Sanders really crossed swords with Howard Schultz. Uh, He's an independent. Both of them. And, and this is what I don't understand. Bernie Sanders is an independent. Howard Schultz is an independent. Aren't they on the same team? Aren't they on the same side? Why would independents argue Aren't about they these busting things? the corrupt duopoly drift glass? That's what they're up to. <laughs> My understanding, <laughs> given all the third party bullshit I've listened to over the last 30 goddamn years, is the reason you have independence, Matthew Dowd, is because you need to bust up that third party duopoly. However, uh, or alternative B is the word independent doesn't mean a fucking thing, means nothing. And I, I'm going to do it one more time, Blue Gal. Wrote mm-hmm. a post in 2009 called the Independent Grand Falloon. Yes, you uh, did. Because Kurt Vonnegut, bless his heart, wherever whatever, wherever he is in the afterlife, coined the term Grand Falloon, which means a proud and meaningless association of human beings. Mm-hmm. It means nothing. It, uh, the, the example he uses is Hoosiers. I'm a Hoosier. You're a Hoosier. We have something in common. No, you don't. You've got nothing in common but the fact that you once lived in Indiana or might have been born there. Independent means nothing. As a term, it means nothing at all other than you're too politically cowardly or stupid to understand which side is which, which are the good guys, which are the bad guys, or, or you're, you're a Marxist, or you're and a Marxist. You can't, you can't say that out loud in Vermont. Right. So or, you run for president as a Democrat, and right. then you switch back to independent, so you right. can continue to be a Marxist, but you don't use that word. <laughs> or you're one of several dozen million Republicans. Yeah who don't want to take ownership of all the bullshit you said and did during the Bush administration. Or the Ford administration, or the the Nixon administration, or or the the Reagan Reagan administration. You don't want the past, you don't want your past catching up with you as a, as a personal responsibility party member. So you just pretend it never happened. You put on a funny hat, you call yourself a tea party, and then you say you never there. I didn't do it. I don't know nothing, but that I am so sick of independence coming out of the mouths of people who are just lying or cowards or grifters. Yeah. Cover um, cover-ups. Yeah. But I will say this. Um my first posts when my blog began, Jesus, it's it's coming up on April, isn't it? Yeah. My 18th blog anniversary is like in a week. Um the the first posts I ever wrote were about both sides do it and what a lie that is. And that's going mm-hmm. on 18 years ago. And can you imagine how sick and tired I am of writing about this subject? So, let's move on. This week The Democratic legislature and the Democratic governor of New Mexico passed a bill into law 
giving free school lunches to all school children in New Mexico. (laughs) Meanwhile, Republicans in North Dakota have killed a bill to provide free school lunch to kids in low-income families. Mm -hmm. Here's a quote for you. I can understand kids going hungry, but is that really the problem of the school district? Is that the problem of the state of North Dakota? Said North Dakota State Senator Mike Wabima. Guess which party? Yeah. And guess, I'm guessing he's also a church goer, blue gal. Colossal jackass. Uh, Disney just quietly stripped the power from Ron DeSantis' handpicked board that was supposed to oversee Disney World's government services. In an amazing move of legal genius, Walt Disney Company quietly pushed through a pact and restrictive covenants that would tie the hands of future board members for decades. According to one lawyer, Disney's move, quote, completely circumvents the authority of DeSantis' board of governors, unquote. Disney defended the agreement and said they're acting within the law. And you've got something to add to this, don't you, Blue Gal? I do. Um, Princess Lilibet was trending uh, this week. And it is because the way that Disney set up this whole uh, clause of or set of rules to thwart all of Ron DeSantis's bullshit uh, includes a legal clause that requires uh, it to exist. All of these clauses are to exist until the youngest, here, here it is, the declaration shall continue in effect until 21 years after the death of the last survivor of the descendants of King Charles III, King of England, living as of the date of this declaration. So what that means is all of King Charles's grandchildren whichever one of them <laughs> dies last, uh-huh. 21 years later, this declaration shall stay in effect. Oh, that's so wonderful. And it's, so, it's these lawyers knew what they were doing. You can yeah. set up any kind of bill or law or arrangement and say, until this person dies or until this set of heirs dies, this shall be in effect. And they chose... The descendants, the li- currently living descendants of King Charles III, the youngest of which is Princess Lilibet, who is the biracial, American-born child of Harry and Meghan. Uh-huh. <laughs> Who's now, by the way, officially a Disney princess. A Disney princess. And, you yeah. know, the, the uh, lineage of this family is, and particularly the women, is to live close to 100. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm sure the Disney lawyers knew. Yep, plus 21 after that. Plus 21. So, plus so 21. Ron DeSantis will be long in the ground by then. And Florida should be either, I don't Might know, Might be an in the ocean or sir, hopefully not run by an asshole like Ron DeSantis. But this, um, is, this is what you get when you have Disney lawyers uh-huh. versus what you have when you have Ron DeSantis deciding how he's going to thwart Disney. Aha, uh-huh, I have forget- you now. Don't forget from our show last week, Disney is now going to hold a gay workforce development conference in Florida with the CIA in attendance next fall. All right. Has Ron DeSantis never seen a Disney movie? Doesn't he know what happens to villains in the Disney Disney movies? Disney villains do not turn out well. They They don't don't survive the movie. Yes. They tend to be short and mean and cruel, and they tend to get at the end real bad. So, you know, okay. From TechCrunch, Twitter is dying. Since Elon took over, he has set about dismantling everything that made Twitter valuable, making it his mission to drive out expertise, scare away celebrities, bully reporters, and on the flip side, reward the bad actors, spammers, and sycophants who thrive in the opposite environment, an information vacuum. I am on Newsy on Mastodon, uh and I am on Spoutable. As Blue Gal, uh-huh. feel free to fo- follow me there. And I think you're Drift Class, right? I am Drift Class on Spoutable. I'm Drift Class on Mastodon. I'm Drift Class on Counter Social. And I'm mm-hmm. Drift Class on Post News. So um, there you go. So, so you know, I'm, I, I can't guarantee that I'm uh, like I'm playing every note every day because. Yeah, it's hard. We, we're going to so. have to boil this down to one or two of them eventually. But 
in the meantime, planting your flag everywhere is the thing to do. Yeah. It's like Shatner screwing every woman he can, you know, <laughs> seduce across I don't the think galaxy. It's like that at all. No. It, no. It, well, it's the theory of panspermia that all life in the <laughs> universe began when William Shatner. Captain Kirk is. Yes, that's what we need is Disney Travel? to say all of the descendants of Captain Kirk. Oh, in, God. In Perpetua. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he traveled back in time and seduced the, the first uh, living creatures uh, that were bipedal and intelligent. And therefore, all of us are descendants from Jim Kirk. True I don't that. want to hear. And that's the, just the truth. That's not some QAnon nonsense. That's just science. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of science and the science of flight. That was a really awkward transition. I don't care. Uh, Springfield is now more flyover than ever, Blue Gal. Mm -hmm. uh, the little town where we live has an airport, and that airport is going to not have United uh, United Airlines on it anymore. Here's the headline. United Airlines to suspend flights from Chicago O'Hare to Springfield. While United Airlines will suspend flights from Chicago to Springfield, American Airlines will start two flights daily between the cities. So it's not that bad. The main reason for the suspension is because of ongoing pilot shortage. Yeah. Let's do four hours on workforce training. Yeah, I would you love could. To talk about you could. Really could. And I, uh, I there, take the train, of, folks. Yeah, Amtrak well, runs from Springfield to Chicago. Yeah, so and it's comfortable, and you can comfortable stretch and out. Comfortable, lovely, and you don't have to go through two hours of waiting in line in security. And yeah, and, and nobody's going to come by and say, uh, you know, we're going to experience some turbulence now, so get back nope. to your seat. Nope. It's it's a nice ride, and it does. It is a nice every ride. Stop Every stop between uh, here and Chicago is a uh, town that has a prison. So, you know, or you college or college yeah. or college. Yep. Anyway, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Coyuta. She is about 13 and she sits on the couch every night with mommy while mommy reads. She is a little bad. She enjoys tormenting chipmunks. But she clears up any mouse problems, so we take it in stride. And of course, Coyuta, who in this picture is sitting next to Mommy while Mommy reads, so she's got her job. Mm -hmm. She eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve Pet Store Perfection or Dollar Store Dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Coyuta. She is such a pretty kitty at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. We really do. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag fire to joy. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and we love doing this podcast and all of our podcasts, really. Many of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. we got all the different ways you can support our show, and we appreciate you so much. Please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please get someone else to listen to. And thank you for doing that. And we want to thank Hal Sparks, who had us on last Friday yeah, on his was, show. So if you've never a, seen uh, Drift Glass before, uh, yes. you can go over there to Hal Sparks' YouTube channel. And we were on last Friday. And he did have technical difficulties. He did. and We, we did not will that into existence, but there yeah, were technical difficulties. We, we kind of did. But, <laughs> and here's, here's the behind the, the scenes thing. Uh, it happened like three times and it was hilarious because Hal's famous for having technical problems because he's a cutting edge technology guy who tries yeah, new things. Yeah, he's trying um, everything. Yeah. But, you know, we just went right on talking, even though Hal wasn't there because we like talking to each other. And uh, those outtakes really, uh, we'll cut them together someday and that'll be a hell of a podcast. <laughs> well, then there was a time when apparently the power on our internet went off. Yes. For like three seconds. Mm -hmm. And we blame Junior Dude for that. Yeah, or a cat. Junior There's Dude makes an appearance as well. He's he does. There. Junior Dude shows up and smiles and waves and comports yeah. himself very well. And oh, sorry, acquits himself very well. And so, yeah, it was fun. How's a fun show? And he really is a kind of an invaluable source of information. And he does Absolutely. it every day. He's just an inexhaustible. He keeps me energetic. sane. You want to he know really who does. keeps the sane maker sane? It's Hal Sparks. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, this week the Internet Kitties are handing things off to the chaplain of the United States Senate, Barry C. Black. Let us pray. Eternal God, we stand in awe of you. Lord, when babies die at a church school, it is time for us to move beyond thoughts and prayers. Remind our lawmakers of the words of the British statesman Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Lord, deliver our senators from the paralysis of analysis that waits for the miraculous. Use them to battle the demonic forces that seek to engulf us. We pray in your powerful name. Amen.